In the early spring of 1942, a brave group of men under the command of General Douglas MacArthur were making their gallant stand against the Japanese forces. Remember Pearl Harbor, we were at Corregidor, and remember Bataan or slogans we'll never forget. We'd like you to meet some of the men who better than anyone else know the true meaning behind those words. These are the men who were forced to lay down their arms during the hectic days of siege at Corregidor, Bataan, Subic Bay, Clark Field, and Manila. These are the men who for nearly three years were imprisoned in a Japanese concentration camp. Some of these men were forced to make the infamous death march and were fortunate enough to come through it alive. Today, Manila has been liberated. Clark Field is ours once again, and almost daily American prisoners of war are being rescued by the advance of our forces on Luzon. A handful of American Rangers and Filipino guerrillas in a surprise and daring raid freed 511 American soldiers from a Japanese prison camp only 65 miles outside of Manila. Evacuated by air, these men are convalescing in hospitals before their well-earned trip back to America. Let's hear the story from the men themselves. According to Bunk Tag, you're Robert Bell, is that right? That's correct. And Travis here tells me you're from England. Yes, I saw How does an Englishman get in with all these Americans, anyway? Can you tell me why? Well, uh, I wrote to Japan on the Japanese prison warship and uh, was sunk off the coast of Luzon. It's from a shore there, and uh, the Jap picked us up and took us to this Japan upon the prison camp. And that was where the Americans were, and that later on you released all together, is that right? That's correct. Well, one thing I kind of wondered about, uh, did you have any mail calls there? Did you ever get letters? Well, I received one letter in, in 1943. One letter in all that time, in about three years? That's right. Well, did they let you write any? Well, they allowed us to write um, a printed card they used to produce to us, and um, set phrases, set sentences, such as my health is good, fair, bad, and you used to alliterate the word you didn't want to use. Did they kind of tell you what to write even then or not? Well, uh, they allowed you to put that in there. I see. You can tell your health. If you want to say it was poor, they let it go. Yes, they would. Did any uh, packages come through from the Red Cross or anything like that during the time that you were in prison? Well, we received a consignment of Red Cross supplies in Singapore in the latter part of 1942. But uh, after that, the only kind of Red Cross supplies we received was a very small consignment of uh, local stuff, which was bought by the Swiss Consul in Bangkok. I see. Other, other supplies, for which we knew that had been sent out here, we never received. They found it too much trouble, or else they used them themselves, is that right? We knew for the fact that not more than 10 miles from us in the warehouse full of cost supplies, and they wouldn't supply them to us. I see. Just a matter of the Japs would not carry the supplies on to you after the Red Cross provided them. One thing I wondered about, were you allowed to play games or have any kind of recreation? Well, after we completed the work on the railway, we completed the railway itself, they allowed us to organize games amongst ourselves and even allowed us to have concerts. But while the work on the railway was in progress, they weren't allowed any amusement at all. It was all work and no play, huh? Yeah, exactly. How'd the concerts go? You just get up your own little musical groups or something? Well, we had quite a number of professionals among us. So oh, I we see. Did pretty well out. Well, I want to see a couple other fellas, so I think I'll run along now. But so time to get back here. Okay. You're Pat Parker, is that right? Oh, Where are you from, Pat? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Sooner, huh? So eight to five. So eight to five. <laughs> well, I wouldn't doubt that. Well, uh, when were you taken and where? I was taken on Corregidor. On Corregidor? Yes. Remember exactly when? May 6th. May 6th. And what did they do with you the first thing after that? Did you be close out of drill a while or something? Or? Well, they started us cleaning up a little bit. They marched well, you back to a camp, or? Well, they marched us long second drive. That's right out on the corner of Corregidor. I see. And then what was the first thing you had to do? What was the routine? Well, the first thing that I, that I done in the line of work was burying the dead there. Burying the dead there. And after that, what? Well, we stayed down till the 24th, and they're taking us on boats and taking us to Manila. To right in Manila? And they're afraid you up down the street or anything like that? Well, they didn't exactly afraid us. They watched us down there go over to the Philippine prison. And then uh, you were on what they call the Nichols Field detail, is that right? That's right. And how did that happen? Well, I was 
sort of a lot rough, a lot of rough to go to work. <laughs> and uh, what camp uh, did they get that from? Where did you live while you worked on that? Well, I was at uh, Camp Run, and they taken a detail from Camp Run to Nichols Field. We was quartering the old fast school schoolhouse on the I see. Well, I guess about five miles from Nichols Field. And then you had to walk field. back and forth through the field every day to work? Back and forth, that's right. And how many strips did the Japs have in there? When, uh, we had one strip, right? That's right. And the Japs put in how many more while well, you worked? We put in three more strips. Three more strips. And all by hand? All by hand. Well, uh, could you tell me just a little bit about what you did, you and your buddies? Uh, well, I was working on what we call track two. I was, uh, one of these little mining cars, you know, they had the tracks laid down to run the mining cars on. We had to push them to into a car. Up an incline? That's right, 45 degree angle grade. They were loaded with dirt and rock. Dirt and rock. We filled up all the slushies, put rock in them, and they rolled them with steam rollers. That's all the equipment they had there was steam rollers. Steam rollers? Wasn't done with mine power. Mm. How long did you make the runways? Well, I'd estimate about 8,000 feet. Well, uh, maybe I shouldn't ask this, I don't know, but what type of persuasion did they use to make a man work in case he didn't want to or in case he didn't obey? Pick handles. Pick handles. That's right. By just hitting a man with a pick handle. So well, right? not only hitting, they beat. Like beat. If you knock you down, they'd stomp you and kick you out. Well, now, what did you weigh when you were captured? You remember that? I weighed 183 pounds. And what was the lowest weight you hit after you were down, you might say down to the low end? Well, that was Nicholas Field. I got down to 75 pounds. And 183 pounds, right. turned down to 75. Right. And uh, now one other thing. Uh, did the Japs ever torture you or anything like that? Or would you mind mentioning a well, case or so? Yes, one case they were doing a little torture. And I got hung up to the thumb box. By the thumb? That's right. Are there any scars on there? Well, how did that work? How did the whole torture go? What was the cause of it? What did they do? How long was it? Well, uh, they couldn't have talked until they were there. Well, the last I saw her, they beat her to death. And they beat me a while, and they pulled me up to the thumbs. I hung out there 72 hours. Without food or water. Without food or water. But to make it worse, why, they set a pitcher of water out in front of us. And then uh, about every 30 minutes, they'd come along and drop a piece of ice in it. That was pretty hard to take. Yeah, I bet. Did you finally pass out, or did you keep conscious all the time? Well, I stayed conscious all the time, but I couldn't stand alone when they took me down. Are there any special Japs that you'd like to meet alone sometime in the dark alley? Yeah, I would. <laughs> well, can you tell me a little bit about them? Do you have any names for them or anything like that? We had a more special name, nickname. Such as Wolf, Killer, Fox, Clark Gable. What did Clark Gable look like? Well, he had Clark Gable's best days. <laughs> he wore a white drum and carried a bamboo cane all the time. I see. What about the wolf? What did he look like? Well, the wolf, he was uh, had sort of a wolfish looking face that we would call him a wolf. He wore these big horn rimmed glasses. Had a little very nice tie, something like Hitler's. And those guys you'd like to meet some That's right. right. Well, if you don't, well, maybe some of us can, Pat. And thanks an awful lot, and hope you get better fast. Just here, this is my buddy, Don Smith. Don, are you? I'm happy to know you, Don. Right. Where are you from? Boulder, Colorado. Colorado? Right. You? Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, why both you fellows were forced to make the death march after you were captured. That's right. Now, uh, how did that start out? Would you tell me a little bit about it? Well, after the surrender, we stayed in the sun for about a day and a half, and then we started marching to San Fernando. That was our goal. We marched for three days and three nights, and, uh, well, the main, that part about it, we didn't have no food or water. The only water we could get was up a care about wellers and drainage ditches and stuff like that. And even though the Filipinos tried to give us food there, but they wouldn't let them. And several times they bayoneted women and children trying to give us water and food. But then we finally made it, thank God. And that was what, from there on, we was transported to a prison camp. Mm -hmm. Bucks cars. How many men do you suppose you lost? Do you have any idea why you won this march? Well, I'd say we lost about, uh, on the group I was in, there was 800 men. I'd say we lost about uh, 150. 150 out of 800? Mm-hmm. 
they fell out of line and they were bayoneted most of them, you see. And did you, how much weight did you lose? Do you have any idea at all? Well, I was weighing about 160, and when I arrived at camp, I was weighing about 118, 318. That much for three days and nights. My son, I suppose, all the time. My son, no water, even. What made me lose the weight, I suppose. Well, how long did you stay in the camp? Well, we stayed there about uh, two months, and then we were taken to the number one camp at Cabana Con. And that's where you met your friend here, Don? Mm -hmm. that's right? where I met Don. And what kind of work did you do there? Well, we was mostly doing work around the camp, trying to fix it up so we could live in it, sanitary and stuff like that. What did you consider to be the worst feature of the whole three-day march? Well, it just seems to many of my friends that is, uh, couldn't make it. Well, they couldn't make it, they were killed. And if you would fell out and tried to help any of them, or if you received the same treatment, too. Just many of them got away with it. Now, did the march last three days, and then you were loaded in the box yes, cars and taken to a Donald? Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that trip? How heavily did you pack in the cars? Well, there were hundred men to each of these little, little box cars. And of course, there's trains over here, and up the full state side. Not three riders, but whoa. <laughs> and we were packed pretty close from there. It comes down and locked the door on us, of course, so we couldn't get out. How long were you in that car that way? Well, let's see. We got on the uh, train about 1 o'clock, I believe, something like that, and got off about 5.30, I believe. Uh, pretty well packed in there. hundred men in a little box car like this. Right. Hardly standing room, right? No, well, there wasn't. Two or three men passed out, and no place to fall, of course. Place to they couldn't pass out. That's right. Did they unload you out of Diamond? Uh, no, it was a town called Tarlac. And it, Seven kilometers, I believe, they were only in camp. And you walked on in the camp, and then what happened after that? Well, we had to sleep on the ground or where we could find a place. Uh, no food there for two or three days, no water either, except what was in the river, and they told us up, it had a lot of dysentery in it, so, so it didn't. Then really you didn't have food for almost a week or so. That's right. Yeah, that's right. What was the toughest personal experience you can remember that you had in the time you were in prison? Well, I believe the, the water was about the toughest situation. I think you can go a little longer with, without food than you can water. You should know. <laughs> oh, I should. <laughs> well, what uh, did you have to eat during the time you were in prison? What was your diet? Well, Mostly, it consisted, of, it consisted of rice and greens, a little salt on some honey, a little bit of that. And that would be food you would probably grow on the prison grounds or something like that. That's right. And what about recreation? What did you fellas do to kind of pass the time when you weren't working? Well, we, we had games of our own. We could uh, play. We had a few decks of cards. And uh, Ace and Juicy, things like that. Were you ever tortured personally by the Japs? Well, no, not exactly. Just usually run of the mill stuff. You were beaten for almost any little thing. Uh, especially out on the farm, I, one of the Japs worked me over a little bit with a pick handle. Inside of that, I wanted to the cause of that. Well, if someone tear down in another little plot of ground was working, he was standing up stargazing or something, and they had their little tricks like that, and pick them in the first one handy rather than walk the length of the plot and go get someone else. So you took the punishment to someone else because the Japs was lazy, is that right? So, okay. Well, fellas, I think that kind of takes care of it. If that's all right with you, if you don't think of anything else, I'm very happy to meet you, and I'll see you again shortly, I hope. And if you see Jim Yeager before I do, I'll tell him hello, huh? Okay. Here you go. Your name is uh, Oliver Wetzel. Oliver Wetzel. Where are you from? Iowa. What part of Iowa? Spencer. Spencer. Well, that's Northwestern, right? Right. When I came in a moment ago, I noticed you had a scar on your leg. Would you mind telling me how you got that? Sure. They uh, got it during a bombing raid on the state of the bomb landed and the state of the rock from the first four And then how was it cared for? Well, I was 
taking care of in the hospital and Craig and Ralph uh, were removed from the prison camp and then Alan Dock was transferred in there. After you were hit, taken a prisoner, I went back to the right? Right. Well, if you get back to hell, so I do. I'll say hello because I'm from down the south. Sure will. Sit down. Shortly after dark, I decided to turn in my abandoned bunk. I went in the barracks and sat on the ledge of the bunk and started to take off my shoes. Suddenly a lot of shooting started. And I thought the end had came. I was under the impression that it was a massacre, which some of the old timers, you know, we sort of expected that. Well, I hollered to some of my friends to get up and take cover. I bolted out of the drawer, and I can't see very well. However, I found a ditch, not the cleanest one in the camp either, and I dived into it. Uh, a few minutes after that, I heard the voice of Americans hollering, "Grab your wounded and hit for the main gate. Then I was quite sure that our American voice was in the camp. And, uh, well, I can't see very well at night. In fact, I can't see at all when it's dark. And, uh, one of the uh, rangers grabbed a hold of my arm, and he led me through the camp. And on the way through, I stepped on a, something that felt like a body, and I said, oh, I'll rest on somebody. The ranger said, that's just a jib, that jab. Come on. <laughs> so, uh, he led me on across the road and into the brush, and I fell down many times. And dragged him down with me, but he hung on to me, and then he turned me over to uh, a gorilla. And well, we got into the brush, and I was falling and stumbling over everything, and the boy was hanging on to me just like a leech. And finally, we got into a banana grove, and well, we ran into an ambush there. Bullets were flying in every direction, and Bo finally found a hole, and we crawled into it, and then I had to take off my clothing. I had a bright coat and a short, a short trousers, you know, and well, I had to take them off, and I went through the brush naked, and you know, I just tore myself to pieces, but I managed to get along all right. Uh, there at the heavy part of the firing, I tried to get the Filipino boy to go and save himself, and I was willing to go into the brush and try to hang on until morning and then work my way through some way. And couldn't get rid of him at all. He right there with you all the time. Right here. Huh? He hunted right to me. You have a lot of respect for these rangers and these Filipinos, but now... Oh, huh? boy. You can't beat them. Well, that must have been quite an experience, and certainly thank you a lot for telling me about it. Oh, uh, you're quite welcome. Hello, oh, the Indian, a good old USA.
It is impossible for us men of Santa Tomas to ever pay sufficient high tribute to the American women who have been prisoners with us here. They've kept our spirits up when we failed and when we've gone to bed because we couldn't take it anymore when we've died. The women have kept on going. They've done their job. The women have done their job here in Santa Tomas, and it has been a wonderful job. As a matter of fact, some of them, when the American soldiers came in, could hardly believe that those women had been interned all this time with us. They still looked so healthy and so strong. One of the finest examples is Mrs. Isla May Challick, and she's had a tough time too. Her husband, a lieutenant in the Air Corps, is a prisoner of the Japs, but she hasn't seen him for a long, long time. She knows not whether he is alive or dead at the present time. Isla May Challick is from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Isla May, you're probably the best example in this whole camp of how American womanhood has managed to stand the rigors and, and uh, atrocities of internment life and still get by, still looking healthy and, can I say, even beautiful after all of this. Tell me, what is the secret that you women have had? Well, I should say American willpower because we knew that nothing would give the Japs more satisfaction to break us for us or morale. And I would hate to admit that a Jap had been able to do that. Well, that's really uh, some psychology. Uh, you weren't here all the time, were you? No, I came in uh, July the 2nd from Frigidor. Oh, you were on Frigidor? Yes. You came in uh, at the time uh, all those fine army nurses yes, came in? Yes, I came in with the nurses. Well, what were, was your reaction to Santa Tomas life at the time? Well, after what we had been through over there, it seemed like paradise at first. And after being here, shall we say, 10 days or two weeks, we soon realized that it was only due to the American's initiative and organization of the camp. You're quite right. We made this camp in spite of the Japs. We did everything for ourselves in the first six months when you were not here. Yes. We even fed ourselves. Well, uh, where is your home, Isla May? Tulsa, Oklahoma. And since you've been here, have you ever heard from your husband? I've had two cards, one in October and one in November of this year. Well, you're luckier than most people here to have even heard from him. Uh, when this is all over, are you going back to Tulsa? No, I'm, I believe I'll stay in the Philippines. I yeah. see. Among our junior set here in Santa Tomas is the daughter of Roy Bennett. Mr. Bennett was editor of the Manila Daily Bulletin, and the daughter, Joanny, has been with us for some time now. Joanie, how old are you? Eleven. You're eleven years old? I'll be eleven in March, you know. Oh, well, you're one of the lucky girls, then. Your next birthday is going to be celebrated in liberty and freedom. It must make you very happy. How do you like the food here? I love it. You love it now. Uh, one week ago? Not so good. Not so good is right. But aside from the joys of liberation that have come to us, there have been some other almost miraculous things happen. As an example of those miraculous things, there were separations. Anyone of the American community who did not come into Santa Tomas eventually, we took for granted was dead. We had heard from time to time that some of the boys got away and got back to the States, but we could never know. And we simply took it that they had passed away and that the Japanese had gotten rid of them, even as they got rid of some of us here in the camp. So you can imagine the pleasure of immediate reunions among families. Mrs. Jessie Hansen has been with us in Santa Tomas for these 37 months. Imagine her joy and pleasure when coming in with the Liberation Forces was her husband, Kenneth Hansen. The Hansons are from Portland, Oregon. Jesse, all 3,700 of us are probably the happiest people in the world, but you must be completely out of this world. Well, I believe I am. As a matter of fact, I thought he was out of it uh, about three years ago. Yes, I know, <laughs> for a different reason, of course. Uh, you've got a lot of reasons to be happy today, haven't you? My birthday for one. Your birthday for one. Uh, you're liberated for another. And uh, this gentleman sitting uh, next to you here, I think, is the other reason? Mm -hmm. My husband. Come back to you at last. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a complete surprise, wasn't it? it certainly was. Uh, Kenneth, uh, how did you happen to get back here? Weren't well, you separated uh, at the beginning of the war? Yes. I believe Jessie was here in Manila, wasn't she? Jessie was in Manila, and I was on the Sparty Island at the mine. And uh, she couldn't get back, and I couldn't get up to Manila. Uh-huh. And so we were separated all during the war. I was down there, and she up here. And finally, uh, after having been with the guerrillas for some time, well, I managed to get to Australia by submarine, okay. back to the States. And uh, I was with the engineers and sent back out here and got here in time to come into the camp on the very first transportation available. Really wonderful. And, well, it, uh, uh, by the way, uh, I see that you're looking much, much better than uh, the average attorney today. That's because he bought me a whole new outfit from San Francisco, and it's only a month old. Wonderful. One of the particularly cruel things about being in a Jap prison camp has been the fact that the overage and the women and the children have likewise been interned with us. The Japs have liked to talk about their munificence and their beneficence and their love of children. The fact still remains that all children under 10 years of age received exactly half rations, and the rations for grown-ups were starvation rations at that. This has meant terrific sacrifice to the grown-ups because they have insisted that the children always get the best of it in spite of the jam. We've fed our children, but many of the parents have starved. A typical example of this is one of our most popular families, the Brooks family. There were four of them, father, mother, and two young boys, twins. The father, a few weeks ago, died of starvation. The mother was killed by a Jap shell. The two boys now are orphans, of course. The remaining of that family of four are just the two boys. Barney? Kurt. Oh, you're Curtis. Well, Curtis, I guess you know how everybody in this camp feels about the swell way you fellows have taken your troubles here. Yeah. And, uh, Bernie, I, that goes for you, too. You've yeah. been a couple of swell American boys, and all 3,700 of us want you to know about that. Now, of course, you did have a lot of hard luck, all right. In addition to the rest of your hard luck, I think you were liberated a little after the rest of us? Yeah, a day and a half later. A day and a half later. Tell us about it. Well, uh... Japanese, when the American tanks first came in, the Japanese retreated to our building and then decided to stay there. They, and the Americans didn't want to kill everybody in the building, so they just waited outside till the Japs decided to walk out. After They let them walk out after a party. Do you remember how many people there were in the education building then? I mean people, not Japs. Uh, there were around 213 Americans and... Uh, how many boys? Boys, about uh, 30 or 40 boys. And the rest were old men, I believe, weren't they? Older men, yes. There were very few men of between the ages of 20 and 45. Now, let's see. We got out at approximately uh, 9 o'clock on the night of February 3rd. Now, do you remember the time when you boys finally were able to get out of the education building? About uh, 9 o'clock in the morning of uh, February the 5th, I think it was. Well, anyway, you finally did get liberated. How did that first meal taste to you? Oh, it tasted like heaven. <laughs> well, boys, I think your bad luck is over now. By the way, where are you going? We're going back to Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. You have uh, relatives there? Yes, my uncle, uh, on my father's side. Uncle on your father's side. How about uh, your mother? Any uh, relatives on her side? <laughs> yes, uh, she has a brother and a sister in New York. Sister. Well. Uh, you'll have banana splits and uh, plenty of fruit and plenty of real food back there, and this will all be just a bad dream to you after a while, boys. Yeah, I hope it'll be that way. Well, good luck to you, and I think that we can all say thanks to the American forces that came in here and liberated us before it got even worse than it was. Yeah.
Well, we're finally on our way after more than three years under the Japs, aren't we? Hmm? It seems incredible after waiting so long. Yeah, it doesn't it, Bill? It's been such a long wait. It surely has. Well, we've been starved, we've been abused, we've been regimented. They violated every agreement that they ever made, including an address with which they said uh, they were going to treat us in accordance with the Geneva Convention. But we're finally free, and we're on our way home. And that means more than anybody will ever know except to say we experience it. Absolutely. It's a great day, one of the greatest days of our lives, to finally be free and on our way back home again. We've gone through so many strange experiences. Yes. Sometimes it seemed as though we were down in the depths beyond the call, and then we all got to the heights above us. Anything yes. you ever expected, and now we're going to live again. That's right, one of the happiest moments of our lives. Absolutely. I suppose one must go through the depths in order to appreciate the heights. Yes. And then to come to sort of normal living again, we'll keep saying, do you remember? Do you really think we ever really experienced those things? <laughs> If we really go through all of that, well, are we the same people again? Well, uh, we never will be the same, but well, uh, we can't go through these things untouched. But perhaps we've learned a lot. As old as we are, we're not too old to learn. We've learned how wonderful the Filipino people can be to us. Haven't we, though? They have been the most marvelous people we've ever known. Absolutely. And when the Japanese talked about bringing culture to the Philippines, that is about the worst absurdity that ever was created in any human mind. Absolutely. The Filipino has a culture far superior to any Oriental and a heart bigger than all the world. Really demonstrated it to us. They haven't they indeed. They have been wonderful indeed. Helen, can you believe that we're on our way home? My God, after all these years. Oh, I canceled three terrible years in Santa Tomas. A half a cup of rice a day isn't very much. I'm ready for the cool mm -hmm. Colorado mountains. I'm going back to Akron, Ohio. You are? Boy, am I tickled. Hmm. Where are you Wonderful. going, Helen? Well, I think we're heading for New York City eventually, but we want to see America first. <laughs> I'm going home to Washington, try to put on this 45 pounds a lot. Little did I think we gave out starvation courses in the university years in the Philippines, but we had one at Santa Tomas, we'll never forget, huh? Well, I lost 70 pounds myself, you know.
Mrs. Doreen Garwick, G-A-R-W-I-C-K, of Los Angeles, California, wife of Lieutenant Warren Garwick, United States Navy, now prisoner of war in Japan. My husband of eight months was sent to Davao, a prisoner of war, and I hoped that I'd have a chance to see him when we were sent down here to Philippines, but I learned that I had missed him by just 16 days. He was sent to Japan. But I'm hoping that I'll see him soon and that we'll be able to spend our fifth wedding anniversary when our boys get to Tokyo. But sitting, Sister Helena of the Order of St. Anne with headquarters at Tangkao, China. Standing, Mother Ursula Mary. Thank you, Dindy. Maybe the Dindy I am to follow. Sister Helena has just said in her native tongue that she thanks God for the arrival of the American Army. We have been in concentration for the past three years. We will be very glad when the war is over. K-N-E-E-B-O-N-E of Grass Valley, California. Last year, while in the Baguio concentration camp, two of my buddies escaped, and uh, because I was so close to them, I was taken to the MP headquarters in Baguio. While there, <coughs> I was given a physical beating and was tortured by the uh, being hung by my thumbs from the a beam in the jail. Then, after three hours of this and grilling, I was put in a cell, a small cell with 17 other inmates, and fed on two small balls of rice a day and uh, very little water, and <coughs> was then uh, left for a week there. And believe me, I'll never forget the Japanese. Mrs. Marion Gray, G-R-A-Y, of Tampa, Florida, and her son, Billy. My husband was with us for the first month of internment, but now Billy doesn't have a father anymore because one day the Japanese came and took him to the military police headquarters, and while there they beat him and tortured him until he died, trying to make him confess that he was a spy for the United States government. Before the war, my husband and I were students, together with 60 other missionaries in the School of Chinese Studies, which was moved to Baguio here in the Philippines from Peking, China. Four of these students and one of our Chinese teachers was beating, beaten and tortured, trying to make them confess that our whole school was a school of spies. My husband died and the others fortunately recovered. Billy and I are so happy now that the Americans have come and that we soon expect to go home to the States. Billy knows that his father's in heaven, and he almost thinks that America is heaven from the way we've described all the good things there.
This is Liberation Day plus 13. Two weeks ago today, the civilian internees of Los Banos prison, 21 miles south of Manila, were liberated under the most dramatic circumstances in the history of this war. After three years of indescribable hardship, these people are free again, allowed to do and say what they please, and full of hopes and plans for the future. Only now they are coming out of a daze. They're awaking slowly from the, to the fact that this miraculous rescue is not a dream. I have no words to describe to you what actually happened. Let us hear from the people themselves. Mr. Stanley Kingsley, formerly general manager of the Trans-Pacific Trading Company, 527 Fifth Avenue, New York, and ex-chief of police and fire department of Los Banos internment camp. Mr. Kingsbury, would you describe in your own words your reaction to your liberation on February 23rd? I'd be very pleased to. I'll go uh, in advance just a few hours. Every evening and every morning we had the physical roll call. That is, all the internees were taken off the road for roll call, 6 to 6.30 in the evening, 7 to 7.30 in the morning. The uh, night before, everyone was ready for the roll call. As a matter of fact, in the roads, when word came from the Japanese officer of the day that there'd be no roll call, that sounded rather ominous to us because we knew, according to Japanese custom, that no official executions could take place after 6 o'clock at night. In the morning time, we put the regular roll call signal in. Everybody was getting ready for roll call. Prior to that, we heard the drone of what we first thought were planes in the air. Afterwards, we decided that they weren't planes. It sounded like tank mortars. And then finally decided that probably it was the Japanese army retreating toward us. It looked like a bad day. Only another day of the 1144 days, which I had been in camp. I went about my business dressed, doing the regular duties in the room. When, all of a sudden, I heard the sound of planes very near, looked out of my cubicle, and found first three planes came over one of the lower barracks. So low, they actually were seen to be touching the roof. Immediately, six more came over with them. I watched them. I wondered what they were so low for. When they got out, about uh, 300 yards from where I was quartered, I noticed a white sheet drop out of one. I'd read a great deal about parachutes. I'd never seen them so near me before. All of a sudden, the nine planes were letting these parachutes out. It just seemed that the air was filled with them. At that time, the shooting began. The Japanese bullets were flying thick and fast. The only thing we could do was get inside, lay flat on our stomachs in the middle of the barracks on the third floor. Things were pretty hot there for about a half, three quarters of an hour. In the meantime, the boys that come in told us that we had to evacuate. We only had just a few hours for them to get us out of the camp. The drillers were around, the parachutists, the M tanks had come in. We were told to grab only what we could grab, take under our arm. We uh, got a few things together, left most of the important things behind. And in the question of a few minutes, we were on the M tracks, where we rolled out of the camp, down to the shores of Laguna Dubai, at the lake, it was nearby, two kilometers away from the camp. And as we were about to enter the lake, of course, we were picked up by a machine gun nest, Japanese machine gun nest. Our three guns in the tank let loose. The tank behind us also was under fire. In the meantime, the P-38s were overhead, protecting our exit. And late that afternoon, we arrived after a very, very interesting trip across the lake, under escort of the planes in the present place where you're talking to. Well, I imagine, Mr. Kingsbury, that you felt that the entire United States Army was dropping on your head when they started coming. I certainly did, and I even have to pinch myself now to realize that I am really certainly dead, and I even have to pinch myself now to realize that I am really free and talk and do as I please. You can do together. anything you want to, Mr. After Kingsbury. 1145 days under the Emperor from Japan, you can't realize how I feel. No, sir, I can't. Thank you very much, Mr. Kingsbury, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Many wonderful things have happened since the liberation of the people from Los Banos. Families have found each other and old friends found out that they are still alive. One of these incidents i like to introduce to you now. This gentleman here is uh, Reverend Leopold Damrosch, a grand nephew of the famous composer and conductor Walter Damrosch. 
And the soldier here on my right is Matt Davenport, the son of the famous movie actor Harry Davenport. Now, uh, Father, did you recognize Ned when you saw him for the first time? Well, not at first. He's a good deal older, and he's added a uh, uniform and several stripes. How about you, Ned? Well, I consider it very inconsiderate. It's probably damn right to make me chase him halfway around the world to find him. But when I did catch up with him, I was awfully glad to see him. Well, Ned, I've never been so glad to see anybody in my life. Well, uh, except those paratroopers that dropped in on us about Francis. <laughs> well, tell me, uh, speaking of paratroopers, what do you think of the American Army? It looks like a pretty fine army. How do you like our uh, new machines and gadgets and techniques? Oh, it's wonderful. I imagine on the receiving end, it is rather wonderful, too. And that's the end of the on. I <laughs> yes, I can imagine that. How long is it you haven't seen each other? Uh, it must be pretty nearly 12 years, isn't it? About 11 or 12. 11 or 12 years. Well, why don't you shake hands and keep it up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Father. Thank you, Thank you man. <laughs> During the lonely days in Los Canyons, people craved entertainment. I'm introducing to you now Bob Jones, a very clever young man, and he's going to tell us what kind of entertainment it was in Los Angeles. Well, our entertainment in Los Angeles was strictly air cuts. We made up everything out of old boxes, and koala, and bamboo. We had to make the best of what we could. And uh, in my case, for instance, why, for lack of a trumpet, I had to imitate one. Well, I wonder if you could show us a little bit of that. All right, I'll try imitating Clyde McCoy's Sugar Blue. Okay, go ahead. Two months old. 
And you can hardly say that you've ever been there. No. Uh, I understand, Mr. Kramer, that you were wounded by a stray Japanese bullet during the liberation. Would you care to describe that for us? Well, there really isn't much to say, except the bullets were flying right and left, and we were so excited we didn't know what to do, so we lied down on the floor and put a mattress across on their drift, and before we knew it, we were hit. The bullet went through Mother's arm and then my abdominal wall and into my friend's hand. Then we were rushed to a hospital and then put into a tank. Were there any other internee casualties? Yes, one more girl. Was she seriously wounded? Uh, she was shot through the hip. I see. Tell me, uh, Miss Kramer, what are your plans for the future? I really don't know. There's so many things I want to do that I can't make up my mind. Oh. Well, what do you want to say? What do you want to do? Hmm? United States. The United States. You mean you want to go back to the United States? <laughs>